This is part two of a workshop in very brief form that I gave to students in Perth, Australia in November 2015 on optimizing the brain waves and the vagus nerve networks for various kinds of physical, mental, and immune response and deep meditation practice. It is not the entire uh, harmonic and toning workshop, but it's a part that I think that will be useful uh, for people here. Now, as we know, there are nerve bundles along the spine, and these are physical reflections of what we call the chakras. Uh, and we can count them as essentially seven. And this is a diagram that uh, has been made. I'm showing on the right-hand side the uh, symbols that are applied in Hindu uh, yogic uh, theory to these, uh, these chakras. And then I'm showing here a chiropractic chart showing on the left-hand side the connection to the organs that is made in the nexus of these particular nerve bundles that uh, go all the way from the root of the spine to the, uh, to the brain. Now, chakras mean literally wheels uh, or uh, centers of energy. Uh, they really are a network system or a harmony of electromagnetic fields generated by nerve bundles along the spine. There are seven major bundles. The biggest one is the solar plexus in the brain. However, the most active one is the heart chakra. And the heart chakra receives, the heart, the physical heart receives and sends out 10 times more signals than the brain does every minute. So, you know that, you know, this, this is the chakra system. There's down here at the bottom, at, at root chakra, there are four petals, and then there are six petals, etc., all the way up to a thousand petals for Sahasrara or Brahmarandra. Now, um, the chakras originate and emanate from heart chakra. Heart chakra is the center of your being. And uh, in a ritual in, in, in the mass, for example, they have a, there is a, is, is a part of the mass called the sursum corda, which means the uplifting of the heart. The esoteric use of that is to visualize the heart as coming up and now the heart and the brain are together and you're looking out through the heart. Women, it's easier for women to visualize the brain sinking down into the heart, but that's what the sursum corda was used in ancient liturgies for. Um, the uh, heart chakra is, is essential and uh, that is the only chakra we uh, attuned by itself and there is a there is a, a, a sound for that which I'll show you there's a syllable for that as well uh, it's an ah type of syllable um, heart chakra is the seat of divine consciousness it's it's it is into heart chakra that all the, the energy chakras uh, descend from the higher triad and ascend from the lower triad at the time of death and at the time of deep, deep, deep meditation. So we divide the chakras into higher and lower triads. The higher triad is the throat and the ajna and the crown. The, uh, the heart is the eternal jivatma or seed of the soul. And the discarnate human soul, if you're not in flesh, it consists of the heart chakra supporting the higher triad. This is what you look like energetically before you have a body. When you get a body, then uh, the heart chakra emanates the lower triad of the solar plexus and the hara and the root at birth and in an incarnation into a body of flesh. Uh, but they're not those. Th these lower chakras are chakras that you work with, especially for health and things like that. But you don't work with them individually. So. As I say, they're a networked system of harmonies. The crown chakra, which is also known as a Brahmarandra, is also represented in the ancient uh, Brahmanic drawings as a rainbow. It's called Sahasrara, 
and it's a rainbow of networks. It's the master chakra that connects all the chakras. And it's traditional chakra shapes, you know, are, are associated with increasing numbers of petals on a lotus. Note that neither the traditional colors or shapes for the individual chakras appear in the traditional crown chakra petals. But this is what the crown chakra petals look like here, like that. And they are the rainbow colors. They go from basically infrared to ultraviolet. Um, so uh, these are the seven colors that are show associated with that particular spectrum. They're new the Newtonian colors, violet, purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Um, in Tibetan Buddhism, they often describe five chakras because they consider these two to be one chakra and the generative chakra and root chakra to be one chakra. But, but most Tibetan work is done using seven chakras. So we don't work with individual chakras except the heart because that unbalances this harmony. That would mess things up. If you have a fellow who's got bowls and things he wants to put it on your solar plexus and do things, don't let him do it because it will mess you up a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> so we attune all the chakras as a system through crown chakra as the master chakra, Sahasrara. This is what we... We use sound harmonics that vibrate the throat and the skull and the eardrums and modulate the brain waves. So we attribute the rainbow colors uh, to the octave, the, the seven <coughs> major frequencies of the, of the one octave of visible light. If you look at the frequencies of visible light, it's exactly one octave, double frequency, up here at the highest violet and a single frequency down here. It's like one octave in music. Um, so Newton's classical uh, description of, of a prism of a, of a continuous spectrum like this were um, violet, purple, blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. And we well, attribute these, we will use these as attributions, the color attributions, when we put together what we're going to, which is mantra, yantra, and uh, uh, mudra, and some other things all together to do this attunement. So, visible light is a tiny, tiny part of the spectrum of, ultra, of, of <coughs> electromagnetic uh, frequencies. It's just one octave. It's it's in there. <laughs> so it's a microcosm of the macrocosm of the whole electronic uh, electromagnetic spectrum. And just as we are a microcosm <coughs> of the macrocosm, so this 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 one octave of light is a microcosmic representation of that. So I'm going to take a little. Okay, so now we can think of the seven chakras as an octave, as a networked octave um, in the human body. But they're not wheels, they're not things you can see, they're energy that is uh, part of who you are and that are associated, that runs up and down where your spine is and your vagus nerve is. Uh, Pythagoras, when he uh, defined the harmonics on a string. This is what's called a monochord. It's like a, like a big cello with one string. If you played guitar or anything you know, if you press it down in the very center, then you divide it in two, it will go one octave higher. And if you take it by a third, it goes up a fifth, and by a fourth, it goes up a fourth, and so on. Uh, anyway, he related, Pythagoras related those to uh, many different kinds of things. I've just shown a drawing there that relates to our ideas of chakras. Um, 
So we can relate the spectrum of light to that with red at the bottom and, and violet at the top. <clears throat> the, uh, also, the, the Hindus related these in terms of uh, number of petals on a lotus. They re represented it that way. Uh, and at the very top, the thousand petal lotus is the Sahasrara. So each of the seven harmonics corresponds to one of the seven divisions in the octave of visible light. Uh, the yantras, or two-dimensional form, color, frequencies of light, uh, stand for each chakra, and they were given to me by my teacher, Mother Jenny, as shown to the right, like that. So root chakra is a square that's red. Uh, hara, or generative chakra, is a crescent with a cross, it's really like an onk. And then solar plexus is just a, a, a circle, uh, like, uh, you know, the sun. The heart chakra is an upturned pyramid that's colored green. That's the center. And then an equal-sided blue cross for the throat, and then a, uh, a, a crescent moon with upturned horns that's sort of purple and then a seven-pointed star at the top. There's a lot of significance about the seven-pointed star. <clears throat> so we can, we can associate these as yantras and these as, uh, as colors of the yantras. But these, these shapes were given to be my, my teacher, my mother Jenny, and they were the shape used to initiate people into a high order that she, uh, she did. And I didn't understand what they were for until after she died. So I want you to listen to the sound of each harmonic of the seventh through the first. So I'm going to be going e -l -l. So at the top, the highest sound is going to be E, and the bottom sound is going to be O, and all the things in between. So let's do that on this. <coughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. E. These are the, the vowels. I'm going to use E L. And now, if I can qualify each one, this is the heart chakra. That's the sound of the heart chakra. It sounds like a major third in music. But what we're going to do is we're going to go from the top down, and just so we can see what E-A-O sounds like. E so let's have each person try this, the e a o and see if you can articulate the separate uh, harmonics that are in that. Just uh, try it and see. E try a higher, a higher pitch. Oh, yeah. <coughs> now, if you go really slow, you'll hear the individual harmonics. Take it really slow. If you do this in the bathroom, <laughs> you'll you'll be able to hear your harmonics. Yeah. Oh, no, no, don't, don't, don't go don't go e ya go e slow slow. E Slide down. E, e, e. How do what's your tone? What are you what are you gonna sing it on? Let me hear your tone. E. So go. E. Don't go from E to ah because you miss all those harmonics. Go real. E. 
to see what you can get in between. Yeah. Too fast. Yeah. 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 No, you slip real fast. You want yeah. You don't want to go yeah. We want to go yeah. That's all that we want to get that all in between the e and the ah. Uh. Let's so move through the vowels very slowly. Yeah. You went right. You went right from here to here. You know, went from e to ah. You got to you got to slide through it. Real. Try one more time to slide. Okay. That's fine. That means short of breath. <laughs> Now see you're going so fast. Try to go e e e Well, let's pass the microphone over because it's not happening yet. <laughs> Try to slide a lot slower than that. <coughs> Good. And if you if you do that enough, you can start to differentiate each one. Getting control over it is not easy. Okay. It requires a lot of practice. So let's, let's try next. Max, you are the master. You got every one of them. <laughs> Practicing the bathroom. <laughs> let, let, let us see if Hector can do it. <laughs> You're going nice and slow, but there's we can't really hear each each one will pop out, and when you get there, you kind of try to hold it for a minute before you go to slide down to the next one. Okay. Should I try again? Try again. Oh yeah. So try e try that song try try that note e no down e no no e e e down low no not not that tone lower than that you're in the their pitch is too high for you to get the harmonics right e Okay, now try it again a little louder and with the mic real close to your mouth. You're getting several harmonics. That was pretty good. Are you want to try it? <laughs> Ooh. Try e a a e a just a e try try from the bottom up try going ooh like that. each time.
Well, actually, you try to control with your tongue, too. Let's let you try, too. Nobody's going to be real great when you start. I guess you have to practice this. <laughs> Except Max, of course. <laughs> no, you were pretty good, too. <laughs> it's not, oh, God. It's, Try not to think of it as vowel, the vowels that are written up there. Just think of it as you're going, you're sliding down from E. Like that. You start from an open mouth to a closer and closer. several but you probably didn't hear them but you got several okay <coughs> so this is then when you do uh, an intoning with an open vowel, you close it with an mmm, so it comes through your nose, for an equal amount of time as you held it open. So if I were just doing a heart chakra, <laughs> that's how I do it. You close it at the end. Okay, so... So this is the thing that people have to do, it's difficult. Now, Eom, have you ever heard that before? <laughs> Eom, okay. Uh, the Gnostic Magical Papyri, uh, here's Marcus's uh, Gnostic Zodia, made of vowels. Uh, the Greeks had uh, what they called uh, a zodian of the Ephesia Grammata, the seven powerful vowels that were used for intoning by by uh, people who were sorcerers, witches, magical people. This is figures called Damnamenios. And Damnamenios <laughs> uh, has interesting things where E is at the top in the, of the spine and O is at the bottom. So these, these things were known and used by uh, ancient people, and I'm going to show you in, in a more in interesting use. The high priest, the Jewish high priest, was also known as the Baal Shem Tov, the Lord of the uh, Good Name, which is the good name is Yod Hey Vav Hey. Um, and this was intoned in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement uh, to a uh, attune Israel back to God. <laughs> it was a, they also did things like uh, ran a, released a scapegoat into the desert with the sins of Israel on it and all that stuff. But it was a day of atonement. It's like the word attunement. And the pronunciation or of the name of God was so, was so holy that it was only known to the families of the Levites. Yeshua, Jesus, was, a fan, was part of a Levite family. That's why his brother James served as a high priest on the Day of Atonement in the Holy of Holies at one point. And he also, Yeshua also wore a seamless white linen robe, which was the robe of the, the priest of Levite. The Levite tribe had the right to serve in the temple. 
and uh, so uh, only they could they could serve in the temple uh, and they knew from their father to son to father to son the proper intonation of the name of God um, Here's a, here's a Kabbalistic diagram of a human being. It's made out of Yod, He, Lav, He. You notice that the He on the bottom is the legs and the He in the middle is the arms and the Yod is at the head at the top and so on. That's because it's also a symbol, Yod, He, Vav, He is also a symbol of the human being. And in Kabbalistic thought, the glory of Yahweh, as seen by Ezekiel, uh, was uh, was the name Yod Hey Vav Hey was actually a part of the what we call the imagery or the way the imagery was described, uh, and this was the imagery that was used to create later Merkaba mysticism and the ascent to the throne of God, which we're not talking about today. So, in the story of the high priest, uh, the 32 paths of Genesis, which are related to the names of God, uh, are a, what we call a perfect tree. And the tree had prolapsed. And that's what you see in the Lurian and, and Cor, uh, the, the, the kind of Kabbalah that the movie stars pay a lot of money to do today, you know, uh, uh, that's based on the Zohar. But the Zohar was based on much more ancient traditions. And so, in the Zohar, they never even talk about the perfect tree. They don't talk about how to get there or what to do with it. Um, so, Yahweh is a code for a powerful invocation. And I'm going to show you how it's pronounced, and then you can become a Baal Shem Tov. But be warned, if you're a Baal Shem Tov and you pronounce the name of God the wrong way, or do something with it, the entire world will end. <coughs> but we'll hopefully won't end this time. <coughs> so Yahweh is Yahweh, and it's intoned. So. Yeah. And then the rest of it is What you what you have in that in that word, in that name of God is a is a code for how it's intoned. And the intonation of that word is bringing divine forces all the way down into incarnation, into the lowest part, and then raising it back up again. This is what was called in the ancient world returning grace. The idiom returning grace is gives us the word in Greek and in Hebrew for Eucharist, which means uh, God divine grace comes to us first and then we return it it's like paying it on uh, the story of uh, a wealthy man and a young man who wants to start a business and the young man has no money to start the business so the wealthy man gives him the money to start the business and the young man says uh, I will repay you when I make it back and he says no don't repay it to me when you're a wealthy man you give it to another young man and pay it forward. That's that's the idea of Yahweh, and that's why the idiom is called returning grace. It's an, it goes all the way to the first pharaoh who united upper and lower Egypt, who uh, would would carry on the ceremony of returning grace. Comes in in Christianity as the Eucharist of the Thanksgiving. So that's the the esoteric code. Of the divine name. This mantra has been passed down through European esoteric schools, but they don't haven't understood what it really does and what it means. And if you properly intone it on the correct generating pitch, 
It brings divine forces down into the human microcosm from the crown to the root. So if I'm doing a blessing, yeah. well, but there's more to it than that, but I'm just showing you. What it does is it brings down divine forces. Um, you always end with the mm, but puts it back through the nose. And so, if I were to do this, uh, e can you hear the harmonics in there? E Produce harmonics every time we speak. Uh, we don't speak on the same tone. I'm going to say, Hello, Hector, how are you today? And all that stuff. But so it's, Hi, Hector, how are you today? And every time we speak, and we're making different pitches, generating different harmonics on different tones. But, and again, boy, they go by so quickly, they don't really affect our brain waves or anything uh, in a very powerful way, in any kind of way like that. But uh, if we consciously use it so we can hear the harmonics and they physically affect us and we make them from our own throat and they affect our own skull and so on then uh, we have uh, something very powerful that we can use but we're going to use not just the intoning we're going to use mudra and mudra and we're going to the sound we'll call mantra the yantra will call these visualizations and their colors. So if we are doing something with this, we're coming from E down to O. This is a, an important element if we know how to use it for things like healing and bringing blessings. By the way, the, the priestly blessing, if you, have, if you carry a priestly lineage and you are capable of giving a blessing, in the Christian tradition, priests and deacon, priests and bishops can can give blessings, but uh, it's a very very powerful force because it can change uh, the situation in elements in a situation, and it's very it's esoteric. Nobody knows what's going on. Uh, nobody knows that you're changing anything. Um, so here we have that. Can be used for various things where forces are brought down through your own microcosmic makeup to the uh, most gross. It evokes a power of blessing when you do with the Kabbalistic Sheen hand mudra, which you probably have seen Spock do. You know, have you ever seen Spock on Star Wars giving you the mm, mm, this is this forms the letter Sheen, and this is a double Sheen, and Sheen is the Hebrew letter that represents fire, which represents the highest firmament, which represents uh, the divine force of spirit, Ruach. So, um, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> around the world. So now let's talk about mudra, because if you're going to do uh, uh, this kind of work in, among, for example, in Hindus, you will also use mudra. Mudra means a shape, a sacred geometric shape that you made. I was just using a mudra there. But uh, here's what in Roman Mithraism, uh, these postures were used, they were called mudras, and they were used to indicate certain things in the initiatic sequence. You also had the same thing in Egyptian uh, mysteries and the Golden Dawn, if you've ever done Golden Dawn and higher initiations, you know that you use uh, Isis and Osiris mudras and things like that. But there are also hand mudras that are used. There are hand positions and sacred geometry that are associated with them. 
and there are in fact finger positions and settlement meridians associated with the fingers and uh, each one of these fingers has a relationship to chakras the thumbs relate to root chakra when you're touching your thumbs this is another way of accessing root chakra when you're touching your two pointer fingers this access this accesses of the hara or generative chakra and you're touching these two that accesses the solar plexus and this one accesses the heart this is where the wedding ring is, is worn on this finger this rep, this accesses throat chakra and I told you that Tibetan Buddhists consider Ajna and uh, crown to be the same so all the fingers together represent both those two higher those two higher chakras and in, in the mudras worth that we're going to use. So we're going to use simple, simple finger positions for chakra attunement with toning. Uh, this is the uh, symbol that we use in THG. With uh, root chakra, we touch our thumbs. With generative chakra, we touch our four fingers. We at the same time envision this, the, 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 the uh, yantra as a red square for root chakra while we're touching our fingers and intoning root chakra. Then while we're touching our four fingers and intoning the, uh, the next chakra up, we're, uh, we're envisioning also the, the, the yantra for that and the color, which is orange. We do the same thing through the symbol. So what it's, a, it's like is like very, when you're, when you've, learn the whole thing and practice it and generate the uh, harmonics and everything you're just going and that's what I did with one more thing when I got the readings I got on the machine and I got to show you the one more thing <laughs> But, yeah, and but so when we attune, we tune from the root up to the top. That's how attunement is done. Uh, I want to, before I will show you this one more thing, I want to stress the centrality of the heart chakra. Uh, there is a there is a thing we do with um, the right hand and the right fingers above all the right, uh, the left fingers, and. Uh, the, uh, the thumbs are in, in a different position when the left is above the right, or they can be touching, and we do this. This is like crown, ajna, throat, heart. Then down to root, hara, solar plexus, heart. And this represents the way, the flow that exists with relative to the heart chakra. So, uh, I want to explain the, explain the centrality of the heart chakra. So, another kind of attunement that can be done is just with the heart chakra. And it can be done this way. Let's see if I can do this without the thing. And we scoop up to get to it in order to hear it. You can't just hit it. Bingo, you have to scoop up to, to hear it. So you see, it sounds like a major third in music, sort of. Um, so if you access heart chakra, basically you're going to put your palms over your heart in the nakham position, which is right hand over heart left hand over right hand. It can be done like this as well. It's called Natham. It's a, it's a posture, mudra, of submission of the lower to the higher, the lower self to the higher self, the lower mortal being to the divine being, and so on. In Golden Dawn, places like that, when they're taking on God forms and being God, they'll reverse this. They'll put the right in front of the left. Uh, me, powerful God guy. But this is the, this is Naham submission. 
palms over the heart is the way I usually pray and so on. Um, <clears throat> the head is bowed and then you intone the heart harmonic. Um, and uh, that is a very powerful way to descend into your heart consciousness and uh, then you can visualize your head and your eyes and your brains all sinking down into your chest and heart and looking inside of yourself and then you just keep intoning until you, you have the whole experience and it's complete. But you have to be able to produce the heart chakra, know how to find it. And if you do that, you will have an experience of your consciousness all being in your heart chakra. So, um, so the last thing we have to learn is Mula Bandha. <laughs> Mula Bandha is uh, the, the yogic idea of Mula Bandha was it's a muscle that you, you, you tense, you contract to keep the psychic for the forces you're dealing with from leaking out your anus, <laughs> the bottom of the spine. Don't want that to leak out. Well, it's the same muscle you contract if you have to pee real bad but you don't want to wet your pants so you contract that or you're, you've got diarrhea but you don't want to crap your pants so you contract that muscle it's what women are taught uh, by by doctors who have babies are called doing kegels I don't know if you ever heard of that but they do that to strengthen the uterus muscles for giving the baby but in both male and female it's you don't squeeze your buns together you just squeeze a muscle if you're a guy, you know what it's like to have an erection and then squeeze and go boing, 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 boing. That's the same muscle. <laughs> you do that all the time, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's my pencil. I write on the wall. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it's it's that same muscle you would you would squeeze to stop anything from falling out of your you know either of those places, and you squeeze it. You don't. Get, like that, but if you squeeze it, you'll get a little sort of thrill up your spine, and you hold it. You don't have to do it too hard, but if you squeeze it like that, that is uh, that is the final part of this picture of how we do this attunement. This is called Mula Bandha. So it seals the floor of the root chakra, so subtle energy can't leak downward. And this, of course, is an outward, invisible expression of an inward and invisible reality. It causes subtle energy to rise through all the chakras when you're doing the intoning. Uh, some people even say it's causing kundalini to rise. So it's the same muscles used to hold in your inner feces or whatever. Do not squeeze the butt muscles, that's not it. So you, you gently squeeze and hold the interior muscle and feel the energy and uh, you squeeze this while I'm toning and visualizing. So if you can't see me squeezing this muscle. But there's one more thing that has to be done to make it work. And that is the breath. This is a breath that is taught in uh, various things, Qigong and Tai Chi and other kinds of things. It's, and it's a Hindu, it's a deep breathing. Most of us breathe shallowly in our chest. Our lungs go down to about here, but we don't fill our lungs all the way up. When you breathe, you go like that. He-man chest goes up, you know. No, you're going to breathe and you're going to look really dumb because your stomach's going to pooch way out. Like this. This is not an advertisement for a male magazine, folks. This is an ugly, watch this one out. All this has to will pooch out if you're filling the bottom of the lung. So you, when you learn how to use this, you're going to go sort of push your stomach down, push everything down, and you'll feel your sides expanding and your stomach expanding. And that's the kind of breath you have to take. So you take this breath. I'm going to show you a simple way 
You don't have to know how to hit the harmonics to do this. This is a simple thing I can teach you. This will energize your immune system and your self-healing. And you use this belly breath and you can uh, visualize with it. So here's what we do. We stand or sit so the spine is in alignment with gravity. The spine has to be in alignment with gravity. It won't work if you're lying on your back. You have to be up like this. Um, you close your eyes so you're not distracted in any way. Then you inhale this deep breath I was telling you about, belly breathing. You inhale uh, by expanding your abdomen in all directions. It's called side breathing or belly breathing. You can practice that. And when you are inhaling, uh, you inhale through the nose and you visualize your breath as a kind of electric violet light flowing all the way down through your spine, illuminating your body on the base of your spine. When you get the breath all the way in, you hold the breath and you squeeze Mula Bandha, like that. So now we're uh, holding the breath and squeezing the anal muscles, Mula Bandha. So now you've got the breath all the way in and it's squeezed and it's held like that. Now you're going to in tone, but you don't have to get harmonics. You're going to keep squeezing it and slowly exhale through your mouth and nose and you're going to intone. And you will hit all the harmonics even though you might, can't hear them. And the mm comes through the nose when you're finally done. And it takes as long as the e-a-o. So let me show you what it looks like externally. <laughs> Um, I'm going to now do it as a healing, so I'm going to put my uh, left hand over my heart, my right hand over my solar plexus. The left hand receives, the right hand gives, and your solar plexus is the brain for your, your, uh, the, the body that needs to be healed, your fleshly body. And this is the source of all things, your, your heart chakra. So I'm going to be like this, we're going to breathe in, I'm going to visualize the, uh, the uh, I'm visualizing my breath as a violet light coming down all the way, and I'm going to go in like this. Now I get to this point, I squeeze the little bond up, and now I visualize again, which I'll show you in a minute, with. But while I'm going Iyaom, <laughs> I also visualize another weight, a wave of violet light coming down from the top down into all the way through my body. So that is a healing power of violet light that radiates through your central spine and all through your body. So I, I'm going to sort of take you through it one more time. You're standing straight, you're going to breathe through your nose. If you're doing healing on your body, you're going to put your left hand over your heart, your right hand over your solar plexus. Then you're going to do that breath I told you about. Pull the bond up and then visualize light coming down. Yeah. <clears throat> So, um, I think I on I think on your um, you might want to give me your uh, if you still have that little drive I gave you. I think I have one sheet on just this that people could have could be printed out. Yeah. So that is, that's an easy thing to do, and this is also a, a very good way just to attune yourself. If you have to do something, you're uh, going to do something that takes a lot of physical coordination, if, 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 as, as well as if just if you're sick, if you're wanting to heal, or if you've got to, if you want to go into deep meditation, this you can do uh, the similar kind of exercise without having to do all the finger positions and everything. And, are much more complicated to learn and to coordinate. 
you can do this very simple thing where you breathe in through the nose, you do the deep breathing, Mula Bandha, and then you um, e and visualize light coming down and release. You do that about three times. If you're trying to meditate, you will all of a sudden get much more out of your meditation. It will take you to a very much deeper stage. So, um, this is this is the the the, the more complex complex one that we teach in THD. Um, you basically are tuning by from the bottom up when we do that. But you don't need to do it this way. This is the one I used when I showed you the results I got. But we don't need to do it that way. I have a few more slides. I'm not sure it's necessary to go through them. This is one kind of an exercise I also teach people uh, that are able to control what they're doing. The heart chakra is envisioned as a green triangle and that's what you start with and then once you've envisioned that you sit with your heart finger mudra and you visualize a small green triangle within the green tri big green triangle in your toe to and tone the heart harmonic and end with mm. and it's this more complicated and then you do the same thing for throat and you do the same thing for uh, for the ajna and the same thing for crown and then when you're coming up from the bottom to a tone to tune this you don't make sounds you are sucking in <laughs> like this and holding Mula Bandha and visualizing these um, uh, root hara all, all of these we can do it that way also this is a we use a seven pointed star, uh, violet star, for advanced meditation posture. The thing I wanted to show you was that this is what we do with our hands. We, as I showed you before, the, all the right fingers above the left fingers and the thumbs touching, we do that. When you're doing a, a single point of meditation, it's good to have feet touching feet, hands touching hands, so everything is one single uh, uh, circuit. You've got no, 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 no divided parts of your body. <clears throat> you can touch your feet different ways. If you're like me, I just sit with my soles and my feet touching like that. But if you're if you're young and wiry, you can sit in all kinds of fancy yoga postures and things. I'm not. <laughs> um, these represent <coughs> the four. Um, Kabbalistic worlds and the the old humanity, the old way of visualizing the human as a five-pointed star it, we no longer use we seven-pointed star and these points of the star right here which represent the world of Daria are we call the wings which is a part of yourself that gets developed as you become more sensitive and more tuned and they transport you in uh, astral, uh, you know, when you're sleeping, being lucid dreaming, and that's why they're represented as wings and also other kinds of psychic things. And uh, this level is that of the hands is Yetzira and that of the feet is Asiya. A um, this is the last thing I'm going to show you. This is a, a form of, of meditation called temple meditation. You want to be in a fairly dark and room I don't so think things are, are quite works dark, here. but all of a sudden Maybe As my teacher, does. Mother Jenny, used to say, okay. uh, there, there would be a very soft and very gentle and subtle lightning, and light will begin to fill your cranium. Uh, very often, the light is not at all white. It's kind of a, of a violet or a purplish, but it's lighter than the other. And if you keep focusing on this and keep in touch with this, once very you soft. have it, eventually it will start to grow brighter. And as it grows brighter, you will start to realize you're actually sensing. You won't be seeing light uh, in the way of visualization or in the way of imagination. It's actually just an awareness of, of enlightenment.
of being lit up, of having light in the top of your cranium, so to speak. And that will appear to you and manifest to you in a slightly visual way, but it's not really something you're looking for that you will see. And if you, as you learn to focus on this, you will have gradually <coughs> more uh, very specific and more uh, more pronounced experiences of this light. And uh, eventually you will get something that starts to look a little bit more like white light. Uh, and all around the edges of it, there may be sort of a purplish or violet manifestation. It might it will seem to sort of distill and then uh, open up like this. And the main thing, though, is that your your cranium is is filled with light and you hold yourself in this light as long as you can and while you're actually in this light or in this this aware in this state of enlightenment or being enlightened uh, you are connected you are attuned with your higher nature and things will come to you that you can't hear or sense or feel at that time but later on you will realize you've plugged into something that has giving you a little download of uh, inspiration and things like that. <coughs> so this is what you do. You just focus on this. And usually people will know when they're done. Um, some kind of manifestation will happen that will clarify to you that you've, you've got your download and it's over now. And the whole thing is maybe a five-minute process, something like that. Now, the other thing to know about this iliaster, this fourth iliaster, the white light, is that it is a substance. It is an actual esoteric substance that has astral and uh, etheric qualities, but also higher divine qualities. And you will be using this light that you manifest as you learn to evoke the white iliaster. You will be using it in your empowerments, and eventually you'll be using it for much more profound things if you go through the first empowerment uh, and uh, uh, through the first order empowerments and finally uh, uh, are accepted and initiated into the second order and anyway, the great profound tantra with all that you stuff. Will be using oh, that you're and the other levels of light to develop very um, uh, high uh, uh, to find very high development spiritually and uh, to facilitate your work on earth so this is temple meditation and this is what you need to do every day do it in the morning when you first wake up after you've gone to the bathroom don't read the newspaper don't look at anything don't stimulate your mind you want to keep your mind as calm as possible the room as dark as possible and do this meditation for about five minutes each morning so the last thing I want to say is for my doctoral dissertation back in the uh, 1969 70 and so on I, uh, I translated the, uh, uh, one of the uh, important discoveries from Nag Hammadi, which is the Coptic Gnostic Library. This was uh, Tractate 6 of Codex 6. Uh, that was the, the Jung Codex that was discovered that was financed by Jung that has the Gospel of Thomas things. This is a, an actual historical... Uh, 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 record of a hermetic initiation, the highest, the highest hermetic initiation, and it's. We also have <coughs> a sort of. Uh, we have a, in in the Corpus Hermeticum, which is a, a late Platonized uh, Greek version of uh, what was once a living tradition. Uh, the tractate number thirteen is called the the tractate on rebirth or something like that. It's the same thing except the only difference is that one is just a, uh, a, a template or a model of what was done. This is the actual hermetic uh, document. And in the document uh, there were these very strange things. Uh, it was called the Hymn of the Agdawat. It was the uh, way of intoning uh, to get in touch with the brothers of the eighth heaven. The, the, the brothers who guided people telepathically. And I've translated the, uh, the vowels into our vowels 
so you could see what it looks like and depending upon how many omegas there were and how many alphas there were uh, that was how long it was held so it looks like this um, a -O -E -O, and then we got a -O -E -O, and then we got a -O -O -O. <laughs> and uh, then o -O. now these are harmonic sounds but they're done on a certain pitch and uh, they were done as part of an initiatic process uh, so here we have <coughs> The initiatic intonation of the name of, of the, the tetragrammaton, the name of God, Yahweh. We have uh, the magic, magical Greek papyri back in the Hellenistic period using intonations like this. We have uh, this used in a high, very high initiatic form in the Hermetic, in the, in the mysteries of Hermes Trismegistus, and so on. So this, this, this is a very old shamanic uh, technique that was known to ancient people a long time ago uh, that was kind of lost. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, the temple was destroyed in AD 70. It was totally destroyed as predicted by Yeshua. And uh, then all Jews were banned from Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 135 after they revolted again, and it became the name of the city, which is called Aeolia Capitolina, and no Jews were allowed. And uh, so Judaism became what we call rabbinic Judaism. It was based on a book, based around the dinner table uh, with Shabbat meal and so on. And uh, the uh, certain families, that were Levitical priestly families that kept on the memory of how you intone the name of God. And uh, this was carried on into the medieval period, but very few people knew it by the time of, say, the, the, the books of the Zohar and so on. But a person who did know how to use it was called a Baal Shem Tov, a lord of the good name. And uh, so, uh, very little was kept of it, very little was ever known of it. And you can read Kabbalistic traditions, you can read uh, Mathers and Westcott and all those people who studied everything they could of Kabbalah, but they never learned about this because it wasn't out there in the open. But it's something that should be, the reason I don't, I think one of the things that Yeshua said is uh, what I tell you in secret, uh, proclaim from the housetops. The mysteries are not meant to be hoarded. They're meant to be shared and used for humanity. So uh, that's why I, I don't say, oh, I've got all the secret stuff. You can pay me $5,000 to learn it, you know, something uh, like a lot of these people do. This is stuff that it's time that it be understood and revealed and used. So that's pretty much it. Yes, let's see, what do I do here?